the topic is robotic partial nephrectomy for complex tumors, but I only got 15 minutes for this. So you know, how much are you gonna do in 15 minutes? I can't make you experts at complex tumors in 15 minutes. Um, but um, what I would like to do with this time, with this 15 minutes, is basically to kind of do a recap of the principles or the major things to keep in mind when it comes to complex tumors. So we talked about these different scenarios of complex tumors. We talked about what are the barriers to progressing as a robotic partial nephrectomist, which you all are, your robotic partial nephrectomist. What are the barriers to you progressing in your experience to help you go from the easier ones to the harder and the harder and the harder? We talked about these before, the idea of vascular control, being confident that you've got the kidney shut down when you need to. We talked about avoiding renal failure, the patients who have solitary kidneys, the patients who have pre-existing renal insufficiency, those are things that are gonna make you shy early on. We talked about proper tumor localization, using the ultrasound, using the firefly the uh, strategies for preventing post-operative bleeding, post-operative urine leakage. So we talked about the scenarios where you want to definitely shut down the kidney. You don't want to do any kind of selective artery or off-clamp. You know, we talked about these different scenarios. We talked about using the Doppler ultrasound to make sure that you have indeed identified the right renal artery that's feeding the area of the tumor. We talked about using the Firefly for the same thing. We talked about avoiding renal failure by virtue of picking the right operation, number one. Uh, you can do ice, so if you are somebody who has a long ischemia time, you may say to yourself, well, my ischemia time is long, I don't know if I can do this challenging tumor, so I'm gonna do ice to help me get this case done. I'd say that's probably not the right answer because ice is not easy. Ice is something for a more advanced surgeon to do. So it's not really a good crutch for somebody who has a long ischemia time. Uh, probably the right answer at that point is maybe just wait until you're further into your learning curve. We talked about selective artery clamping, the red, yellow, green, you know, when to use it, when to stay away from it. Uh, we talked about the renorophy, the important um, technical points. I know this is all recap, but again, these are the important factors for complex tumors. We talked about the intrarenal vascular anatomy, the arteries inside the kidney that you're cutting into when you do a partial nephrectomy. We talked about where to focus your stitching when you do your renorophy, focusing on that junction between the sinus fat and the parenchyma of the kidney. That's where these interlobar arteries are coming up parallel to the collecting system. So when you get a collecting system defect, you should be looking for these arteries coming up alongside the collecting system. And I'm always looking for those near the collecting system. And again, I'll bipolar them if I see them. So we talked about, again, not worrying too much about trying to sew the meat out in the periphery of the kidney. Doesn't hold a stitch well anyway. Uh, focusing your stitches, again, on that junction between the sinus fat and the edge of the kidney. Uh, my advice, again, was to stay away from using cautery when you do your excision for the purposes of margin assessment as well as identification of the collecting system. I showed you my personal preference for how I do the renorophy. We talked about the concept of early on clamping, which is good for preventing urine leak and for identifying bleeders. Because again, once you come off clamp, you've got plenty of time now to go and reinforce the collecting system. In fact, sometimes what I'll do is, if I have a really big collecting system defect, I won't try to run that in the runner. What I'll do is I'll sew around it on both sides and I'll just leave it alone. Then I'll come off clamp and now I can take my time and I can do a formal mucosa, mucosa as beautiful as I want and as many stitches as I want. Uh, but the idea of early on clamping again to give you that plenty of time to put as many stitches as you want to reinforce collecting system or to find bleeders or to do your capsular stitches. We talked about the giant needle club. And again, you're welcome to join the giant needle club. There's no membership card yet, but if we get enough people, maybe we will. I'm joking, of course. And then we talked about the use of ultrasound. So again, I think the ultrasound is probably a, a, one of the biggest contributors to giving you a comfort level to take on more tackling, to tackle more challenging tumors. Is getting comfortable with the ultrasound and getting comfortable with that 3D vision in your head of imagining where the tumor is inside the kidney, how deep you need to cut, the direction you need to cut. Uh, those are really critical. And especially for the completely endophytic tumor, you really gotta be good at ultrasound when you're doing a completely endophytic tumor. So we talked about the idea of rotating the head for the direction of resection. We talked about the, using the firefly. And I showed you the examples of the firefly to get negative margins. Retroperitoneal, we talked about this in detail with Jim's live case. Uh, but I, I want to just put another plug in for encouraging people to learn how to do this if you haven't tried it yet. And again, from my own personal experience, having been a skeptic, having been somebody who did several hundred transparent needle and kind of poo-pooed retro, tried it, hated it, didn't want to do it, 
and then kind of revisited it with the XI and now really enjoy it and do it a lot. Um, my decision tree now is posterior tumor, retroperitoneal. And the idea here, of course, is if you look at the picture on the right, you've got a posterior tumor, a posterior uh, mass on the kidney. Uh, obviously, going transperitoneal is a much longer uh, distance to get to that tumor compared to going through the back. And uh, my own personal um, uh, you know, evolution, again, I, I hope was encouraging to you that you can learn how to do this and you can learn to do it by learning from somebody like Jim who's done tons of them and is amazing at it, uh, watching videos, uh, you know, coming to courses like this. And again, I think a very powerful way that you can really accelerate your learning curve is with case observations. It really helps quite a bit. And so I always encourage surgeons uh, to go out and visit, spend a day or two with a surgeon who does a lot, not just for this. Let's say you're learning how to do a perk or you learn how to do whatever. You know, learn it from somebody who does tons of it. So I welcome surgeons in our OR. I know Jim welcomes case observation. Caden welcomes. So, you know, contact a surgeon. If there's something you want to learn how to do and you think, you know, that guy, he's got a good way of doing that. I want to see how he does it. Go visit them. Spend some time with them. Um, and even though I've only done about 30 retroperitoneal partials, I will do them now on the days that we have visiting surgeons. That's how comfortable I am with it, that I can even have visiting surgeons and I'll show them how to do it. So it's very learnable, it's very doable, so I encourage you to learn how to do it because again, it's going to allow you to take on more challenging tumors. Uh, the posterior hyalur tumor, for example, transperitoneally is gonna be difficult. Retroperitoneally, very doable. It's not gonna scare you at all. It's gonna be you know, a very doable tumor for you. Right. So, so we have the SI. So if you only have the SI, the challenge is going to be getting the fourth arm in. You're going to have more collisions. So you're going to have more frustration, but it's not that you can't do it. You're just going to have more frustration. That's the downside. Um, and so you may want to start with, you know, kind of a skinnier, easier patient where you're going to have an easier time kind of pushing the peritoneum off because you're going to have to get much further medial towards the umbilicus to have enough room to get that fourth arm in. Now, Jim mentioned that previously when he used to use the SI for retroperitoneal, sometimes if he got into the peritoneal, peritoneal cavity, that actually wasn't a bad thing for him because then he'd just put the fourth arm through the peritoneum and then into the retroperitoneal space through that rent. Um, so that's something you can consider doing too. So, um, so it's doable. It's just going to be harder. You're going to have more collisions. It's not that it's not doable. Uh, but certainly for me, I would say personally, go having gone from the SI to the XI, I felt like for me it was a huge benefit and made me much more comfortable doing retroperitoneal partials. So again, this is a recap lecture just, again, to kind of reinforce these concepts that we've talked about today because these are all concepts that are going to help you take on the more challenging, more difficult tumors. If you just keep these things in mind uh, and, you know, remember this when you're looking at these tougher tumors on CT, uh, hopefully you'll turn away less of them and be confident going after these tumors. So again, Neris, Las Vegas, $100 off. Come visit us in Dublin. We'd love to have you. Uh, and then uh, I think we'll move on to the next. Now, I don't know if Jim is back yet from the OR, so he was going to be the next session with um, some uh, example cases, challenging cases. But if he's not back, then we'll go to the last one. We'll do the complications first, and then we'll come back. So has anybody heard if Jim is back? Okay, so we have, um, there's two sessions left this afternoon. There's challenging partial nephrectomy case presentations, and then there's complications, um, which is, again, case presentations. So we can do those each um, for about half hour, 45 minutes each. Uh, we can go back to adrenal and talk about adrenal if there's a huge interest in adrenal. Uh, we can talk about RPLND. Well, Jim's not here, though. We can wait until he comes back for RPLND. So we can do any of the above. Do you want to start with complications? People usually like complications. Do you want to do complications? All right, I'm getting a lot of nods. Maybe it'll wake us up a little bit too in the afternoon. All right.
Okay. So let's start with a couple non-operative complications. So this is, these are all kidney cases, by the way, because this is the kidney master's course. So here's a 69-year-old with a left renal mass. And um, because she was 69 and it was a relatively small mass, she elected to have RFA so as not to have surgery. So here's her tumor pre-op. And then she has an RFA in 2011, but then post-RFA, in 2012, she has a scan in January, a follow-up scan in September, and now she's got a growing, enhancing mass in the bed of the RFA. So what treatment would you offer her, Caden? We'll start with you. So she's got a recurrent mass in the bed of the RFA. She's now 70 years old. Um, this looks like RCC. What would you do for this lady? Well, here are your options. You can survey it, continue with that. You can reablate it. You can do a partial, you can do a lateral. That's it. But, uh, those are your options. Those are the options, yeah. Uh, so obviously, <coughs> 70 is 70, and 70 is not 70. So is she a good 70, a bad 70, an anxious 70? She so she's a good 70, but she's somebody who chose RFA the first time around. So there must have been some reason she wanted to avoid surgery. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you look at this kidney, the inflation zone goes all the way down to the sinus here. It's, and there's too much weight in the middle of it which is kind of strange, actually. Um, I guess I don't see the posterior sign, but I would probably go after it more in a partial fashion. Partial? I would probably, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh. Jonathan, what would you do? Uh, I'd give her a biopsy at first, see if there's, there's a real tumor. Although there's some, as I said, RFA, and you can have lots of biopsy, but yeah, RFA grows for a long time, yeah. uh, just eight months later. Yeah, it is growing though, so it's it's enhancing and growing. I'm willing to bet it's RCC. It's and if you get a negative biopsy, you're not going to trust that. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, exactly. So a lot of choices, but what was elected in this case was basically the interventional radiologist decided to do a repeat RFA, but because it didn't work the first time, he said in his op note, Aggressive. He did an aggressive RFA the second time around. The problem was that if you looked at the late phase CT before the second RFA, the collecting system's right here. So the redo RFA, he's gonna try to burn this whole area over again, the aggressive redo RFA, and the collecting system is right there. RFA is not good for collecting system. Hopefully everybody knows that by now. Cryo would have been more reasonable, but she had a repeat RFA. Afterwards, she developed pain. What do you think happened? Urine. Urine leak. So this is her postoperatively. Um, not only that, but after that second of RFA, now 2013, she developed this urine leak, but not only did they cause a urine leak with the second RFA, they essentially fried her entire collecting system her entire collecting system. So essentially, the only urine this kidney was making was extravasating. Nothing was going down the ureter. This is her retrograde. So she's got a perk tube now because of the urine leak. Here's the ureteroscopy. It's completely cut off. They had completely fried her collecting system by RFA. Uh, and so now she's got a kidney that's leaking urine. Uh, what would you do in this case? Jonathan, since you gave the pyeloplasty lecture, are you gonna do a pyeloplasty on this? Uh, yeah, that's what we did. We actually did a renal scan to see how much function was left. It was only 20%. They had basically fried the entire kidney down to 20% function. So we took it out. And essentially, the entire thing was obliterated all the way down for three to four centimeters down the ureter. So we took a kidney out. Uh, so another non-operative, um, uh, this one I already mentioned. Okay, yes. You know, I don't remember. It was a few years ago, it was 2013. I don't remember. Probably was, I hope so. Well, they probably RFA'd it, it's probably dead. <laughs> she was cured of her cancer, but they killed her kidney. When you see an RFA that goes right into the sinus like that, that's, that's bad news. It's bad news. It's bad, bad news. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a complication of ureteroscopy with a robotic slant to it. So this was a patient that was referred to me 
for a suspected UPJ obstruction. She had several stones, had had a stent um, in and out, and you know we um, basically we did a ureteroscopy to evaluate the UPJ to f try to figure out if she was obstructed or not. So we basically just did a diagnostic ureteroscopy. Her renal gr renogram showed 25% function. Uh, so we thought, okay, let's try to save this kidney if it's 25%. But you can see how dilated the kidney is. I mean, there wasn't a ton of parenchyma there, but it was 25%. We wanted to save it. So we said, okay, let's go and look. Does she really have a UPG obstruction or not? And this is her, you know, ureter ureteroscopy and our uh, retrograde. Um, and uh, afterwards, so remember this picture because look how narrow this ureter is all the way up. Not necessarily obstructed, just look how narrow it is. Keep that in mind. Postoperatively, she comes back to the ER the day of the ureteroscopy. So we discharged her from the recovery room. She comes back to the emergency room in severe pain. We do a CT, and this is what we saw. So any ideas about what happened? Anybody else has seen this before? After ureteroscopy? Nobody. Oh, a couple. So what happened, guys? Got a yeah, so we ruptured a calyx, and then that ruptured calyx bled subcapsular and then caused a hematoma around the kidney. So this is all subcapsular hematoma. Uh, and basically, the reason I believe this happened uh, was because her ureter was so narrow that the ureteroscope was completely occluding the ureter. So all the irrigation pressure bag that we're running in through the ureteroscope has nowhere to go, and so it ruptured out the kidney. So bad stuff happens. So here's a guy. So, uh, yes. What did you do about that? Uh, nothing. Really? Yeah. We just it went away. Because those are the kidneys that actually end up dying. Those, those become. They can. The so page kidney, exactly. So you can have a page kidney. You know that's true. But we we felt okay about it because it was still taking up contrast. So you see, it's still taking up contrast and it, it was excreting. So we kind of left it alone and it, it got better. So here's a 61-year-old guy, had a proximal ureter stone, uh, had a retrograde pilogram, showed a tight area in the ureter right here. So the outside urologist, uh, he wasn't able to get the scope up. He couldn't even get a 4.7 French stent up without difficulty. It was just very narrow in that area. So he did a balloon dilation, and you can see that even when he balloon dilated it, there was still a little bit of waste there, and he couldn't get the waste to go away. So he left a stent in there. And then he came back four weeks later and did a ureteroscopy to treat the stone that the guy had in the beginning. Uh, and then he starts having pain two months later. He has to put a perk tube in the guy. And then he has a CT scan, and you see this stone outside of the ureter. So what do you think happened? <coughs> yes, exactly. The stone was there when he balloon dilated the ureter. He didn't realize that he was balloon dilating the stone and he pushed it out of the ureter. And so it caused a nasty stricture. Um, so in this case, endoscopic options, would anyone try to treat this ureteroscopically? Yeah, it's not going to work. So you can go up there and incise the stricture, balloon the stricture. If there's a stone sitting outside of that ureter, it's just going to keep scarring back. So we had to do a robotic UU. Yeah. Yes. That's the problem. So there it was. It was in the wall. If it was fully out, you're right. You'd be okay, because the ureter would just heal over and you'd be fine. But no, it was in the wall. So yeah, that's what we did. We had to cut it out, and that was the final result. Okay, let's talk about partial nephrectomy complications. So this guy has a partial nephrectomy. He's got a posterior hilar tumor, and this is years and years ago. So I did this transperitoneally. Today, I would definitely do it retroperitoneally. Uh, two weeks after the partial, though, the guy comes back to the office, and he's just having a lot of pain. I said, two weeks later, this guy shouldn't be having pain. Two weeks after a partial, you should be feeling pretty good. So we sent the guy for a CT scan, and this is what we saw. Any comments about that? What do you think is going on? So contrast CT. Is there anything else you want to see? Delayed the delayed images, yeah. So you should always be suspicious after a partial. When you see a fluid collection, it's not just hematoma. Don't just assume that it's hematoma. Oh, it's just post-operative changes, little hematoma, no problem. Look at the delayed images. Get a CT urogram, because this guy had a urine leak. So. There is some blood there, yes, hematoma, but the guy has a urine leak. And I show this picture, I've only had three urine leaks ever, but I show this one because it's the most amazing CT urogram I've ever seen. I mean, look how well they were able to localize this leak, this little tiny leak right there, and it's causing this urinoma. So there's a few different ways you can treat these urine leaks. 
Uh, one thing that people will tell you is that, oh, yeah, just put a stent in it. And I would say, look, don't just put a stent in it. If you put a stent in it, then you've got to put a Foley catheter in the bladder. Because if you stent the patient, every time they void, they've got high pressure urine going up the stent, refluxing, and going out the hole, you're perpetuating the hole. So if you stent a patient for a urine leak, you need to leave a Foley catheter. In this case, though, we actually didn't stent the patient. We didn't perk him, we didn't stent him. What we did is we just put a Foley, because it was such a small leak, such a small leak, that we just put a Foley in for a week, and it actually healed over on its own. So we didn't have to put a drain in the retroperitoneum, we didn't have to put a stent, no perk. We just put a Foley. Um, we admitted him to the hospital because he had a lot of pain, put a Foley in him, took it out a week later. And then the moral of the story is that yes, it was a challenging partial, so you could have justified an nephrectomy on this guy, but even though he had a complication, uh, by six months all of that is resolved and he's got you know, a good kidney left. So partial is still a good operation, even though yes, it does have higher complication rate than radical nephrectomy. So this is a 63-year-old patient. Uh, this is a patient uh, of uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Mike Steifelman, uh, who I'm sure you all know. Uh, and he shared this uh, complication. It's a 63-year-old obese patient with uh, multiple comorbidities. She has a liver mass or a, a renal mass during a liver transplant workup. She had a, a hand-assisted partial. And then post-op day 14, she's got gross hematuria and mild flank pain. So what's your suspicion level? So a patient two weeks after a partial nephrectomy is having gross hematuria. And yeah, I'm having some pain, not terrible. Man, you guys are too good here. Right? That's exactly right. So this is her uh, Doppler ultrasound. So you can see she's got this, you know, this uh, on the Doppler, you can see it's lighting up like crazy. So on the angiogram, so Mike Center for an angiogram, and then you can see here, this is the pseudoaneurysm. It's pretty big. Uh, so obviously they coiled this. So here are the post-coiled images. So this is with it coiled now. And you can see the rest of the kidney still, you know, getting uh, contrast. Uh, so the moral of the story is just have a high level of suspicion. If something fishy is going on two weeks after a partial, then image that patient. Gross hematuria, pain, fever, anything's going on, image the patient. So uh, this is a, an old case um, from a colleague uh, when I was at OSU. This is a 58-year-old guy. He's got an 8.2 centimeter mass, uh, and uh, pre-op creatinine is normal. They did an upper pole heminephrectomy, uh, and the surgery itself went fine. So this was the, uh, the pre-op image. So the pre-op image here, this is the upper pole mass, quite large, and they did a heminephrectomy. Um, Post-op day six, the guy's having pain and gross hematuria with clots. So again, have a high level of suspicion. So they admit the guy, they check his blood counts, his hemoglobin's down to 9-1, and this is his CT scan, pretty ugly looking, uh, some perinephric fluid. And then over the next three days, they just watch the guy, and his hemoglobin just kind of drifts down, 9-1, 7-1, 6-6. They give him some blood, he comes up to 7-9, not a great improvement. Two more units, he comes up to 8-4, so now he's got five units of blood, he's still at 8-4, so what would you do at this point? Any suggestions, Caitlin? What would you do in this point? So the guy's been in the hospital for three days. You've given him five units of blood, and he's at eight four. Yeah, I would. I would take him to IR. So that's what they did. They took him to IR. They did an angiogram, and then you can see here he's got um, this big sucker. So you can see they started coiling some of these smaller things here, and then they ended up coiling this entire area, and then the bleeding result and he ended up with a creatinine of 1.05. Now, one of the reasons I show that case is because you could very well make the argument for a radical nephrectomy to begin with. So I wouldn't fault somebody, let's go back to the renal mass, the original renal mass, I wouldn't fault anybody for saying, hey, I'm gonna do a radical nephrectomy here. Would anybody here suggest that that would be the wrong answer? Yeah, I think it's reasonable. It wasn't reasonable to try a partial, but also would have been equally reasonable to do a radical nephrectomy. And one of the things you have to counsel your patients on pre-op if you're doing a partial for a complex tumor uh, is that, look, there is a higher complication rate, but the trade-off is that we're trying to save your kidney. So you, the patient, have to balance. Save the kidney, have more risk tolerance for complications. You know, we leave it up to the patient. The other, the other point to make real quick on that is if you have gross hematuria after a partial and it comes with a hemoglobin drop, 
can actually go straight to IR. No CT, no CT angio, no just that should be. Yeah, just go to IR. Yeah, I think that's very reasonable. Okay, so a little couple of video clips because people like bleeding. So uh, this is an example of, we did here, we did a right nephrectomy and now we're doing a lymph node dissection which Jim beautifully illustrated uh, in the live case. So this is the cave obviously. Here's where the renal artery and vein were taken. So we're basically working in the interatocaval space. So as I mentioned before during the live case, the aorta is below, the aorta is down here. It's not gonna be next door to the IVC over here, it's gonna be down, it's gonna be deep to the cava. So you just need to be aware of that. So the interatal cable nodes in this position, flank position, are gonna be basically below the cava, between the cave and the aorta, which is below it. So there, right there is the left renal vein, obviously. And then as we move along here, get a little rambunctious. Oops. So it's just a little lumbar vein. So I'm showing this just to show you how I handled it in preface to the next video. So this is a relatively large lumbar vein as you can see. Most of them are not that big. But as you can see here, I'll just use a little bipolar cautery just to get it stopped. And now I can take my time, dissect it out, clip it formally. Uh, you don't have to cut it, you can just clip it, or you can cut it and divide it if it's holding you from being able to do your node dissection. Uh, but in this case, I just clipped it. All right. So here's a similar case, not one of mine, but... Um, uh oh, what happened? Technical difficulties. Why did that not work? Yeah, oh, it's showing for me. There we go. All right, so this is a radical nephrectomy and they're dissecting, or maybe a partial, and they're basically dissecting out the hilum, and then, oops. So he basically was using the cautery scissor as the scissor was up against the vein, and then he tried the same thing that I did before, but in this case, they're using the PK, so he tried to just PK it to get it to stop, and obviously that didn't work. So when that doesn't work, you gotta sew it. So this was a nice illustration too of the idea of getting control, getting a needle driver in, and then switching hands to get your other needle driver. Because you can't sew with a PK, obviously. So this was a nice example of that. And then this is a rescue stitch, as many people will talk about, because it has a lapper tie on the end of it. The idea of a rescue stitch is that you basically have a stitch on your back table that has a clip on it, so that if you get in trouble, you just throw the stitch and you lift up on it. You don't have to tie any knots, it stops the bleeding. So it's kind of a safety mechanism. Any comments about that, guys? Anything you would add? No, the other thing you could do, if you don't like the labrotide there, you can always, you know, with a monofilament, you could pull it back and just tie it out without the labrotide, which is what I do when I use this. So you've got the labrotide that's holding it, but if, they, if you want to tie a knot, they left it on there, but you can actually just pull the labrotide away, you'll have a yep. little tag there that you can suture to, and you don't yep. have to have the labrotide. Good point. Do you, do you open one for every case? I don't, but that's what people do. That's what they talk about. So I, that's why I had to mention I, it. I do. No, I don't. <laughs> for, for an RPLD, we usually get a vessel. RPLD is like a different recipe. No, but I would do it for RPLD. It's the radar. The radar is the same thing about my pieces of the ages. So this next one is an interesting case. And, um, this is another one that Mike gave me. And this is an interesting case, it's a nephrectomy. They're doing a radical nephrectomy, but the hilum is just socked in. It's just socked in. You'll see here when I start the video, this is the hilum right here. And they're basically just trying to figure out, you know, where are the vessels? And you'll see what happens here. So you kind of see thumping, you think there's an artery back here maybe, 
and they're just kind of digging through this to try to figure out, you know, where are the vessels and, you know, where's the hilum, kind of holding on with this hand. Oops. There's the slow motion to really make it worse, right? <laughs> So this illustrates, I think, a good point when it comes to bleeding in robotic surgery, is you get one chance to grab that sucker. So when you get a massive bleed like that, just go grab it. And if, you, if that doesn't work, you get one chance. If that doesn't work, now you're in a pool, just hold pressure. And then try to find it so that you can get control. So you can see it worked here that he just grabbed it. Once he grabbed it, now he's able to kind of slow down. At this point, I would say, give me a needle driver, give me a stitch. You know, those are the things that you should be thinking at this point. But basically, that was the renal vein. It was just sucked in so badly that they didn't recognize it. So now another thing you have to keep in mind that if this is a nephrectomy and that's the renal vein, you don't want to sew the whole thing off because you haven't taken the artery yet. Uh, so basically, they're trying to sew it off without closing the entire vein uh, because you still got to find the artery and clip that. So this is a really a nice example of like emergent bleeding and like what, what do you do you know, urgently to get control. So what would you guys add to this when you have these kind of like sudden bleeding episodes? What are the other things that you're thinking or instructing your staff, anesthesia, et cetera? Well, I mean, you know, obviously you wanna make sure that their the anesthesiologist is, is caught up and they're not behind. Well, he's checking his email, man. He, he ain't paying attention. <laughs> It's like, okay, we got bleeding here. Yeah. If you care. And, um, you know, they got to make sure they're caught up. If there's, if we, we type, we should type and screen. We don't type across, but we type yeah. and screen. We're worried we might convert to a type across. Um, we just get, you know, we make sure that uh, we think we can't control it. Well, this is very well controlled. Um, you know, we might actually talk about what we would do if we had to open it. Okay, we never great. Do, talk about it. I think having the assistant come grab it is a lot of trust. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole lot of trust. If he had it up in the air, I would just get a one handed suture and just, Me too. just sew it. Yeah. Um, it worked, though. It worked. It worked. To give him, worked. Give him credit. The maneuvers for this type of venous bleeding, which for a cape that doesn't work, is pneumo, right? You can pump up, you can pump up the pressure, you can put a, a pad in there, you, know, you can put a bolster in there, like Jim was talking about earlier. Yeah, usually venous bleeding with pressure, you can get it stopped enough to kind of get more ports in, get whatever you got to do, yeah. All right, this is the famous video that some of you may have seen in the past. I've seen it multiple times, but every time I see it, it still gives me a heart attack. Uh, this is Craig Rogers' uh, famous nephrectomy video with the untoward uh, stapling incident. So here you see he's done a beautiful dissection. There's the artery, there's the vein. I mean, it couldn't be better than that. He's bringing in the stapler. Uh, the assistant is controlling the stapler. This is not a robotic stapler. And basically, they're planning to do an on-block staple of the artery and vein. So they're sliding in the stapler here. Everything looks good so far. So now they've fired the stapler and cut, but the stapler didn't actually fire uh, because the staple load had not been loaded properly by the bedside nurse. So the staple load wasn't in properly, so when they fired the stapler, it didn't actually staple. But it did cut, it still cut even when they you know, went ahead and pushed that forward. So now he's got basically artery and vein both cut with no staples on either one. So there's the staple load that fell out now once they released the stapler, the one that wasn't ever loaded properly to begin with. So it's interesting to see, you know, how do you handle this problem? You know, what is he doing? He's basically, he's trying to hold onto it. He's holding pressure, you know, sucking. That left hand, notice how that left hand hasn't moved at all. That's like the life-saving hand right now. And then he's more trusting than I am. I wouldn't have tried the stapler again, but they brought in the stapler again and, and just fired it. It's the only one that's long enough to do it all on one pass. You know, that's, that's the only advantage. Yeah. So he saved the day. Any comments on that, guys? So one thing I would say, well, it was misloaded. Yeah, it was misloaded, exactly. That was the problem. So they're supposed to check, you know, obviously the nurse is supposed to check that. Um, and you can actually see it. it was mis we've all seen this video. Yeah. 
Um, but, you know, that's the thing it had come without Caitlin because it wasn't voted properly. The, the key thing the is one, uh, I had cheated down toward the aortic side and this thing failed, it had screwed. Yeah, that's but right. Up, so he had some margin to work with. That's Otherwise, true. There was still some length on it, yeah. Yeah, another urologist friend of mine, he um, had a different problem happen with the stapler, and that was that they closed it, stapled, fired, couldn't get it to come off. The stapler would not open. They could not get it off the vein. So fortunately, he had left enough distance from the cava, so they were able to come in and control it underneath and then just cut the vein away and leave the stapler connected until they extracted. On this video, if you just yeah go back to it, yep. um, if you can, yeah, you can tell, you'll see it. forward to where um, the bleeding happens, this goes back to the point you made and the one only tip I would say to anyone who has someone else firing staplers for them. If you go in and I tell you See how it's not all the way to the edge right there? Yeah, it wasn't all the way in. <clears throat> I tell everyone who's firing a stapler, the PAs, the residents, whoever's doing it, go in, lock it in, make sure I'm happy, wait for the okay, go ahead and fire. But then once you fire and open, get out. Get out of the way because if it bleeds, I want to see it and I got to grab it at that moment. And what happens here? They're waiting. Yeah. They're hanging out, hoping that, what, this is going to stop now? Like, <laughs> you know? No, seriously. So you staple, open, get out of the way. And then grab it. That is your one opportunity. Like, he got control of it in this pool, which is nice. But if you see it and it's going, grab it and don't let go. And they're kind of like, they took time to come out. Take that stapler out. Get it out of yeah. there. You won't see it. Go grab it. Great point. Yeah. Okay, this is a great case. I love this one. This is a robotic partial nephrectomy gone bad. And I alluded that this case was coming earlier because it has to do with margin. It has to do with somebody cutting into the kidney without having properly localized the tumor. So you saw he marked the capsule, he starts cutting, and then eh, not everything looks right here. Something looks weird. What, what is it? What, what doesn't look right? Yeah, exactly. Look, this is the kidney. That's not kidney up there. So he recognized that he had left all of this tumor behind down here, but now he's got a big venous sinus that's bleeding. Cystin is sucking like crazy. So he gets a stitch in it. You see there's a stitch now to stop the bleeding. So he's got it controlled again. He's still on clamp. And then he goes back and resects this area. So this is somewhere where that firefly would have helped you, by the way. You would have recognized this because it wasn't green. But you just got to do a good ultrasound. That would have saved you too. A good yeah, ultrasound. Grossly violated sample that he's dropped out. It's Big time. The recurrence adjacent to the kidney. Great problem. You want to bag that specimen. So now what he's doing is he's taking some frozen sections from the base. Anybody does this? Anybody does frozen sections from the base? Yeah, it's basically useless. Yeah, it's pretty useless to do frozen sections from the base because if you have a gross tumor violation and you go back and you're doing frozen sections from the base at random spots, you don't really, when you turn the tumor over, I mean, this one is obvious, but let's say you cut a tumor out and you turn it over and you see tumor there. Are you gonna know where that corresponded on the kidney to go and do frozens? You're not gonna know. So Jim, what do you do? If you turn the tumor over and you look at it and you, know, you don't like your margin, what do you do? You've got the defect in front of you, you're still on clamp. What do you do? Well, then I would take a disc of about yeah. two or three millimeters across the whole exactly. new margin. Like, yeah. That, that would obviously that is my final margin. Exactly. I call it a pancake. So then I go back and I take a pancake. I've only had to do it a couple times, but I go back and I take a pancake from the entire resection bed, you know, just a few millimeters, like Jim said, and then you want to orient it for your pathologist. So you want to know which side was the up and which side was the down. Put a stitch in it. Tell your pathologist this is the final margin, the deepest portion of it. Uh, and that's going to tell you whether or not you had it. I'll tell you, if you, if you go to your first excision part of this video, this, uh -huh. this is my comment. This is what I would have done differently. No, not that one. I think we beat that one down. <laughs> so as you're cutting this out, right, the, the issue is, see how much back bleeding you have here? So it shouldn't come to you seeing this when the tumor's out, right? You should, if you get into the, you should get into the tumor. But even in not in this situation, let's say you have a margin at the base. It should happen when it's clean, right? So you should notice that while you're cutting it out. If you have yep. that much back bleeding, that's a time to, to clamp the vein. So I would go back and clamp the vein if I had that much black back bleeding because you're right. Once it's free, you have no choice but to go all the way back and shell out the whole pancake. But if you do it while you're cutting it out and you notice it, which you should, 
you can you know exactly where it is and you can just take it out there. There's a lot of back bleeding when that initial. And again, I'm not making a gross violation comment. I'm making the subtle violation comment. Yeah, I think the answer, you know, my suggestion would be not to go and clamp the vein, but to stitch it. Because the concern would be that if you have another artery and that's why it's bleeding that okay. much, that clamping the vein that, may make it worse. I mean, that was venous. So okay, but you're right. It Either was way, venous, but what yeah. I'm saying is it may be that much venous bleeding because there's other arterial inflow to this kidney. Yeah. So what I would do is I would just stitch it rather than clamping so, the vein. Yeah, get it dry, exactly. So now he's doing the frozen sections, you know, take a few spots here and there, but again, I mean, that's not, uh, not doing anything really. All right, so we learned not to do that. Okay, here's a case. Uh, here you see a tumor. Um, this is one of mine, my own personal cases. Um, so uh, this is the tumor, we're just ultrasounding it. I don't remember, maybe it's five centimeters, something. So here I am now cutting out this tumor. This is a really old case, as you can tell. This is like Da Vinci S or something. So this is a really old case. And at this time, I used to clamp the artery in vein. So the artery's clamped, the vein is clamped, and I start cutting into the kidney, and it's like bleeding like crap. What's going on, guys? You missed artery. I missed an artery. I missed an artery, and the kidney's purple and swollen. So I said to myself, what the hell, man? I gotta unclamp this vein. Look at how swollen the vein is. Now, as soon as we take this off, this vein is gonna decompress and watch what happens to the kidney. It's magical. It's magical. It just goes away. So basically, I had clamped the artery that was going to the kidney that I thought was the only one, but I must have missed another artery. So when I clamped the vein, I should have noticed that the vein got full and the kidney turned purple. Now look, we take that off and now I'm gonna finish this resection and it's bloodless. So I had the right artery. There was no mistake there, but there was more than one. So I had selectively clamped, yes. I accidentally had selectively clamped, but I had clamped the vein. Don't clamp the vein when you selectively clamp. So look at the difference now, how bloodless it is. All right, and then uh, this one is a case of a, an unexpected IVC thrombus. So you can see here, this is the renal vein. This is the right renal vein. And you see, we went in there and we saw this thing floating in there. I thought, oh man, come on, this was supposed to be an easy nephrectomy. This guy's not supposed to have a thrombus in his vein. So we were able to kind of get it out enough that then I could put this lap Satinsky across the base of the vein at the cava. And then here now we're cutting it away. What's that? Yeah. So now, once we cut this away, we gotta sew this cava back up, right? So we sewed it under the clamp, and now my assistant is taking the clamp off. And obviously, this is the complications section of the course, so there's gonna be a complication. So you see there, oops, there was a hole there. What, what's going on? So now I said to myself, really? Is it really that bad? Oh, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> So as I mentioned, you know, you, when you see bleeder, you just grab it, go and grab it. And thank God we had the prograsp in at this point, so I was able to just go and grab it. So what do you think happened? Any suggestions? Cut too close to the city. No, what happened was, uh, you know, I had done a whip stitch under the clamp, but at some point I must have made a mistake and gone over it. So then when they took the clamp off, they were sliding it out of one of the stitches, and now it's a loose spot, and then the rest of it, it's a running stitch, so the rest of it got loose in that area. So anyway, grab it, get control, and then take your time, get the needle drivers in, sew it back, problem solved.